just want to read just a small portion of scripture today and uh, it comes from Luke chapter 2 and uh, I was just thinking about Christmas and why are we having a Christmas message today is because we didn't have it last week and also because Christmas is a 24 7 52 day week a year it's never ending it's eternal amen when you talk about the incarnation of Jesus Christ that's a message that is applicable for every day of our lives God has become flesh and he's dwelt among us Luke chapter 2 and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed the census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria so all went to be taxed everyone to his own city and Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David which is called Bethlehem because he was the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary his betrothed wife who was with child and so it was that while they were there the days were completed for her to be delivered and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn I just put this picture up there because I wanted you to know that we could not get out last week and it wasn't just a mean little snowdrift it was a humongous snowdrift that had plugged us in and uh, I looked out our window and everywhere I looked I thought it surely must be like that and then I was able to get out and I said I think we got all the snow in the county <laughs> because everywhere else you went there was no snow it all blown to our house into our little stretch of woods but anyway again Christmas uh, the message of Christmas is always an eternal message and it's something we want to share this morning for the last four years or so uh, we've been watching our youngest grandkids they come to our house every morning or you know three or four times so three times a week or so and uh, Judah is four years of age and Evelyn is two years of age and um, Judah is a pictured in the scene he always uh, brings with him a football a baseball a basketball you name it anything of sports he brings it and the last November just before it had that cold snap he brought with him a golf club a real live golf club I was afraid for him to have it because it's real golf club and all it takes is one whack upside the head and you know you're a goner but anyway he went out to the backyard he says now grandpa you watch me hit this ball now, see how high I hit it see how far I hit it was that good enough can you take a picture of me and send it to my daddy and then he would say this after he hit the golf ball grandpa can you go get the ball for me <laughs> And I would say, now wait a minute, Judah, that's not the way golf works. You hit the ball, and then you go and you hit the ball again. No, no, Grandpa, you go get the ball for me. Well, I was his gopher, I guess, and that's what Grandpa Pauls do, right? We just retrieve balls for grandkids who love to boss us around. But anyway, you have pictured there. He, ever since he was born, he's brought with him his security blanket. And his security blanket used to be like this, and today, four years later, he still brings it it's in a thousand pieces and it looks like that but I want to tell you since I took that picture it's even worse than that <laughs> he now brings it he brings part of it in his hand and it's all curdled up rolled up like a little ball it's nothing more than a string but Judah needs his security blanket and even if he leaves leaving that little bitty string behind it doesn't doing very well at all now when I stop and I think about of course this time of the year and again we've moved into a new year but I think about Charlie Brown and his Christmas story and Charlie Brown is always the depressed kind of person he's frustrated he's down in the dumps and so he goes to Lucy for some psychiatric help five cents worth okay and he goes to Lucy for some psychiatric help and and he just tells her his doldrums and she says well Charlie why don't you direct a Christmas play that will probably bring you out of your doldrums bring you out of your depression and so he gathers together all of his friends to conduct a Christmas play and they're mean they're, they're they don't want to cooperate I mean he gets very very frustrated and he cries out doesn't anybody know the meaning of Christmas now just a little sidebar I saw two weeks ago that there was a poll that was taken and I'm not sure who they interviewed but 75 percent of those who polled who were polled did not know the meaning of Christmas 75 percent don't you know the meaning of Christmas and just about then little Linus steps on to the scene and he begins to quote the nativity story from Luke chapter 2 
And he comes to that verse where the shepherds are on the hillside, and he says, Don't be afraid, do not fear. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. There's a Savior that's been born. And immediately get, they get up and they go into Bethlehem to worship this newborn child. But if you will notice, and notice in the picture, when Charlie Brown, or when Linus recites those words, he drops his security blanket because he realizes that in Jesus Christ, there is indeed hope and peace and security blanket. Now for Linus, that was very, very difficult. For, Evel or for Judah, it's difficult. We all want our security blankets. It's very difficult to leave them behind. Why? Because we live in a very scary world today. There is a spiritual battle that is occurring between the heavenlies and between the earthly powers of the spiritual battle, and this fear has consumed our hearts. It's captivated us. It's captured us. I've been there. You've been there. It's driven us to make even irrational decisions. Fear has completely just boggled our, our minds, but it's basically beaten us up. It's ravaged us. And I think about the J.R. Tolkien series, The Lord of the Rings, when you have Gothmog and all of his demonic horde ready to invade the city, and he smells the fear that's rising up from the city before him, and he says, very simply, fear, the city is rank with it. The city is rank with it. And so what happens, we know, in this fear that we have, we grab for anything that will give us security. We grab for any security blanket that will give us any hope. And we build these emotional fortresses around our heart because we don't want anything or anyone to step in and to hurt us and to damage us. And when you stop and you think about the fear that consumes us in our society today, you know, you think about the violence, you think about the crime, you think about the drug trafficking, the sex trafficking, you think about all those sorts of things. In fact, before the last election, there was a poll that was taken, and the poll asked people, what is it that concerns you the most? And they said inflation, the economy, the border, you know, it went on and on. But not one person said, I'm concerned about the spiritual climate of the nation. I'm concerned about the spiritual climate of the nation. You see, we need to deal with this issue because fear consumes us and drives us. People are broken, relationships are broken, society is broken, and we need, honestly, a savior who will set things right between us and each other and between us, and more importantly, between God and us. We need a savior, but fear, I mean, it's hard, you know, to deal with sometimes because we all, some of us are more anxiety-driven than other ones, but let's look a little bit at the fear that was a part of the nativity story, if you will. First of all, there was the fear of an answered prayer. How many of you have ever said a prayer, answered, or prayed a prayer, and it basically is just sort of ricocheted off the ceiling? I mean, it bounces off the walls, ricochets off the ceilings, it just basically goes nowhere, and you're saying, God, are you there? Do you care? God, have you forgotten me? And we'll look at that in the future, but where are you, God? And here's Zechariah and Elizabeth. The story is told in Luke. You can read it later today if you like. But here's Zechariah. He's a priest, a pastor, a minister in the temple. He's serving God day and night. Here is Elizabeth, his wife, and they don't have a child. And they've been praying for a child and praying for a child, and there's no answer that is coming and can you imagine that? Here are people in the community, as Elizabeth walks down the street, she must be under the judgment of God. She must have done something wrong because, you see, in that day, being childless was sort of a, a plague or a, a judgment of God. And, you know, he was a priest in the temple. He, that something must not be right. He must not really be a priest. He must really be a hypocrite and he's serving because God isn't answering his prayers. But again, when it comes to the unanswered prayers, the issue becomes this. Praise God, he answered Zechariah's prayer, and John the Baptist was born. But I answered prayers, do we really begin to understand that in the midst of all that, that God is still at work, that his promises are still real, that God still loves me regardless? Yes, sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says no, sometimes he says wait or maybe, but I need to understand that I need the presence of God more than the promises of God. I need the presence of God more than an answered prayer. But we all have the unanswered prayers, the fear of that, but God is still there in the midst of it all because he's come to walk with me and he understands my plight 
Even though others might ridicule me and scorn me, God understands. And we need to learn how to trust in him and to love him and to rest in his arms forever. And then we have, of course, the fear of the impossible, the miraculous. Here's Mary, the story is told. Mary, this young teenage girl, and an angel comes to her and says, Mary, don't be afraid, but you've been highly favored. You've been called by God to bury his own son, to bury his own child. And she says, how can this be since I've never known a man? How can this be? That was such a question that every one of us would ask, right? How can this be? How can this be? Fear not, though. Fear not, because what is in you, this little child, is of God. But we all fear the impossible at times, and we all face impossible situations. It might be a financial situation. How am I going to pay my debts in this coming year? It might be the issue of, of, a, of a job. It might be the issue of forgiveness. I find that there's so much conflict between people today. And you know, you can be friends one day and enemies the next. It hurts my heart to know that happens. Friends one day, enemies the next, and somehow or another this issue or this barrier arises and all it takes is an idea of being able to forgive. Will I be forgiven? Can I forgive? The fear of the impossible. How about a teenager wrestling with what's my plan? What's God's plan for me? What am I all about? What's my life all about? What am I supposed to be? Who's my identity? What's it all about? Or uh, here's a marriage, 20, 25, 30 years. And you've been married and it says for better, for worse, and now there's no light at the end of the tunnel and you're saying, is it possible? Oh, Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know that one day your son would walk on water? <laughs> Mary, did you know that one day he would cause the lame to walk, the blind to see, the deaf to hear? Mary, did you know that one day he would feed the 5,000? Mary, did you know that one day he would raise the dead from the grave? Did you know that one day he would be crucified on a cross? Buried in a tomb and be raised on the third day to bring victory to all of us? Mary, did you know? The fear of the impossible, the miraculous. Mary says, Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And then we talk about the fear of the unknown because here's their fiancé, Joseph. And John Hill shared about Joseph and Herod a couple weeks ago. Very good explanation of all of that. But here is Joseph. Now imagine this. The angel comes to him and says, Joseph, now don't be afraid. But your fiance is with child, and all of a sudden he steps back and he says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute here, you know, that's not possible. You know, she hasn't known anybody and I haven't had any relationship with her. No, no, no. What are people going to think of me? What about my reputation? So he sought in his own heart to put her away privately. And he says, no, don't, 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 don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Because that which is in her is of God. And so we look at 2023, and I don't know about you, but you look forward to 2023 and you're saying, you know, what about the fear of the unknown? I don't know what each day holds. Is my health going to hold up? What about my finances? Am I going to still have a job? Can I pay my bills? What about the future? I don't know about my future. And it's easy to say, don't be afraid. You know, it's easy for me to say, don't be afraid. It's easy for me to hear, don't be afraid. But I want to tell you that I can personally speak from experience that, you know, I, I have to deal with anxiety and worry. It's one of those thorns in the flesh that I've always had. And, you know, you can read all those verses and you can read, don't be afraid. And you're saying it's a lot harder to act on that. You know, I think about two men who went into the jungle. They went on a safari and they were walking through the jungle. And as they were walking through the jungle, a big ferocious lion jumps out in front of them and begins to roar. And the one man turns to the other and says, Now, Jim, 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 don't be afraid. Stay calm. Remember what the book said? The book said, if you look the lion in the eye, it will turn and run. And Jim says, Yeah, I know. You've read the book. I've read the book. But has the lion read the book? <laughs> you know, don't be afraid. Oh, it's easier perhaps said than done. But again, don't be afraid. And through this recent storm, I want to tell you, when you, you know, Someone told me, whatever I do, don't sell my house during the winter. Because the wind sweeps across that field like it's ready to take it off, you know, this foundation. And, and, and God just came to me in the midst of all that and said, do not fear. And he said, now, now wait a minute here. You remember my disciples, they were in the boat and there was a storm that arose. Just remember this, I was in the boat with them. Don't be afraid. And then, of course, you talk about the fear of the unexpected. 
And here were the shepherds, these lowly people who were, you know, it's amazing to me that no one really wanted to associate with a shepherd, but they are the ones who raised the sacrificial lambs. They're sitting on a hillside, and they received a telephone call from God at night. Now, I don't know about you, but through my time of ministry, active ministry, there's one thing I hated more than anything else, and that was receiving a telephone call in the middle of the night. Eight, nine times out of ten, a telephone at the middle of the night met. It was not good news. And I would be going to the hospital, or I would be doing something or another. I hated telephone calls in the middle of the night, and I still do. But imagine this, they're sitting on the hillside around the campfire, and all of a sudden God sends a telephone, a telegram. He sends, a, you know, an ambassador. He sends an angel, and the angel says to them what Linus has already read. You know, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news. Good news! Can you imagine this? Somebody calls you up at 2 o'clock in the morning and says, Hey, I got good news! I got a new grandson in the midst. When was Landon born? About what time? Was that the morning or evening? All right, well, anyway, if you get it about 3 o'clock, you know, it wouldn't have been neater if it had been 3 o'clock in the morning. You could call your parents and say, hey, good news, I've got a new child. And they would have jumped out of bed, hopped in it, and run to the hospital. Why, that's good news, right? But good news, and so they got up and they ran into the city, and there they bowed down, and they worshipped the newborn king. Fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. But there's also a tragic element here. And John talked about Herod a couple of weeks ago, but there was a Herod's fear. And the Magi stop at his palace on the way and say, you know, where's this new child who's going to be born, this king? And immediately he becomes threatened. He doesn't want to lose his own authority. He doesn't want to lose his power. He doesn't want to lose his prestige. He doesn't want to lose his throne. And you know, every one of us have a throne right here in our heart. And there's someone who sits on that throne. Usually, I sit upon the throne, or you sit upon that throne. And we're saying, I'm the CEO of my own life. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. My, my, my grandson had a saying at one time, and he's not saying this anymore, but he says, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> In other words, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm the boss. I'm the CEO. I'm going to run my own life. And so here's Herod. Here are we. And the issue becomes, are we going to say, thy will be done or my will be done? Thy kingdom come or my kingdom come? And we have this thing in our life where, by we wrestle with this in our life, and Herod hated God so much. He hated his authority so much. Can you imagine this? That he decided to issue a decree that all baby boys under two years of age and under would be slaughtered. He dies a horrific death. But the question that every one of us must ask, our own selves, is how do we respond to the birth of Jesus? Now here's where we're going to take a twist. Because in Luke chapter 1, you have Mary's song. And I've been told, you know, and, and been taught this for many years, you know, a, a new babe in a, in a mother's womb is a baby. It's a life. And you can sing to that small baby you can read scripture to that small baby in the womb, and they will hear you. They will respond to that. And so here in Luke chapter 1, she's singing this song called Mary's Song or Magnificat. And she's singing about this Messiah, this, this babe that's in her womb. And she comes to, we come to verse 50, and it says very simply, And his mercy is upon those who fear him from generation to generation. And I want to go, What? Mary is singing and praying that we will fear this little baby that's there within her womb? His mercy will be upon those who fear him? Are we supposed to love Jesus, not fear Jesus? And yet, over the last six months, God has so impressed upon my heart that we, I, that our society, we need to recover a healthy fear of the Lord. Why? Because it's the fear of the Lord that's a glue that holds our society together. It's the fear of the Lord that becomes the, the cohesion that keeps us from descending into moral chaos and confusion. 
And everywhere you turn, the prophets, the epistles, the gospels, the, the revelation, whether you look at the Christmas carols, we all talk about, and all talks about the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. And when you go back to Proverbs, about 10, 12 times he says things like, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In the book of Isaiah it says, the fear of the Lord was his treasure, it was the source of strength and stability for the time. Can you imagine that? You say, oh, no, wait a minute, we're to love God. Deuteronomy, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But it also says in the same verse, kind of same context, that we are to learn how to fear the Lord. So what do we mean by fearing the Lord? Does it mean that we're to fear God like the neighborhood bully who comes along and steals our school lunch money like the Andy Griffith episode, you remember, or, Barney, or a little Opie? Are we to fear the Lord as if somehow he's a thief going to come in and he's going to steal all of our possessions? What does it mean that we fear the Lord? Well, very simply, it means that we need to understand that God takes sin seriously. Sin is an affront to a holy God. And so he sent a Savior to be able to mend the fences and to deal with the sin of our own heart and life and to bring us back into a right relationship with God. How many of you ever heard this saying when you were growing up? You just wait until your daddy gets home. I never heard that. My mom took issues into her own hand. You know, I didn't have to wait for dad to get home. Mom took care of things. Well, here's the beauty of the gospel. Jesus Christ came into this world and he took my punishment, my discipline for me. The wooden cross was, or the wooden manger was exchanged for a wooden cross. The swollen clothes eventually became the claws which would wrap his burial body and he would throw them off and walk out victorious after he had died for our sins. But very simply, it means that God takes sin seriously and so should we. But secondly, it speaks of reverence and awe and wonder. As we come before the Christ child, we adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. He is our Lord, he is our creator. I mean, he created all things. He put the stars in the space, the planets in the orbit. He created the mountains, and the valleys, everything that is, he created it. He is the word made flesh who came to dwell among us. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. How many of you ever read Robin Hood and his merry men in high school or college or nursery school? I don't know where you read it at. But here's Robin Hood. And Robin Hood... Of course, his men are out in the Sherwood Forest, and they made an encampment there. And King Richard has gone off to fight a war in the, Ho in the Holy Land. And he's left in charge his wicked brother, Prince John, and, of course, the Sheriff of Nottingham, who becomes a collusion with all that. And they are taking advantage of the people, and Robin and Hood and his men are out trying to make sort of a, make some, you know, a, uh, do of all this and one day they're out in Sherwood Forest and his men come bringing to him this man who's dressed in a common ordinary garment, a traveler's garment. And they bring him before Robin Hood and, and, and during the conversation the common ordinary traveler says to Robin Hood, did you support King Richard's crusade to the Holy Land? And Robin Hood says, oh yes, yes. I, I supported that but I did not support his decision to leave wicked Prince John in charge. He's a wicked, corrupt individual. So you are loyal to King Richard then. And Robin Hood says, loyal? I would lay down my life for him. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ laid aside his robes of divinity. He came to this earth. He robed himself in human flesh. He looked like a common, ordinary human being clothed in human flesh. But he was none other than the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the everlasting Father, Emmanuel, God with us. And he would throw off those robes, die for our sins, and rise victoriously from the dead. You know, Macy and Nick, you know, Landon has been born. Has your life been any different since then? Did you receive an instruction manual on how to... No instruction manual, you know, no recesses, no vacations... You know, you've, you're always responsible 24-7, wherever you go. Landon, you know, you've got to be responsible for him. I mean, he, it's a 24-7 commitment. Friends, Jesus Christ demands a 24-7 commitment from you 
and from me. And he would later say, we are to deny ourselves and pick up the cross and follow him. So when we come to the manger, we don't just come to a, a little small baby who's like any other baby. This is Emmanuel, God with us, King of kings and Lord of lords. And when we come to this manger, we're either judged or we're redeemed. We either collapse or we find the mercy of God. But Linus had it right. This is what Christmas is all about. I don't know what all your fears are about this morning. I mean, all of us have different kinds of fears, but I think about Phillips Brooks songs, you know. Oh, holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. And that's hopefully each and every one of our prayers, that the Lord Jesus Christ take residence in our hearts and truly reigns upon the throne of our life because the God who has come has come to redeem and walk with us and shelter us and keep us and to be our God forever. Precious Lord and God, we come to you today and we want to thank you and we want to praise you that we can celebrate not only this past Christmas, but even on New Year's Day and the Sunday following that and the Sunday following that and the Sunday following that, that we can celebrate that you came to dwell among us and walk among us. And you came to be born in order to die so that we could have life with you forever. Oh, Lord Jesus, come. Inhabit our lives. Be king of our lives. And may the praise of our lips always be there to adore you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.